Praise the Lord. You're very welcome to our refuel service this evening. And uh, well, we are so grateful to our Lord Jesus that he is present here. And uh, I believe he wants to do wonderful things in us, through us. And he deserves all the glory. So let, let's pray and we will start worshiping him. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather us your body. Lord God, we appreciate that you made us one, made us a family. Lord God, thank you that your spirit is within us and the only desire we have in our hearts is to glorify you, worship you, live for you, Lord. I thank you for this evening, Lord, that you are present and your spirit, we, we give permission, Holy Spirit, to move the way you desire in our midst, to do what you want to do, Lord God. You'll be glorified with every song, every prayer, every word. Lord God, you're so worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Oh, my God. 
magnify you how we exalt your holy name in this place for for worthy is your name worthy is your name Lord we seat we seat our name underneath yours for worthy is your name it's only you it's always about you for you're worthy for you're holy for you're magnificent, for you're glorious in your splendor and your beauty, worthy, worthy is your name, Jesus, our God that saves, our God that is our salvation, Ooh, our deliverer who are counselor, who are healer, how the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, it's you. Worthy is your name. How worthy is your name. Ah, oh, church, we gotta get a revelation of that because worthy is his name.
is in that name that makes everything perfect in your life. Not that you may not have any struggles, not that you may not have any challenges, but he is able to perfect everything that concerns us. Because he is the worthy one, he is the holy one. He is the redeemer, he is God almighty. He is the perfect expression of the Father himself. His name is Jesus. Woo. Oh, we welcome you, Jesus. Oh, we welcome you in this place. Mm, we honor you in this place. Yes, yes, yes. We, we celebrate you in this place, casting down every, every affliction, every, every trial, every circumstance, but we leave him, lead him at the foot. We leave him at your feet, honoring you the one that has the shoulders to bear it. The one that has the shoulders to bear it. Well, we thank you. and circumstances can disappear. Afflictions and addictions, they can, they can disappear. Oh, we thank you for the name. Oh, you deserve it. Oh, you've honored it. Our God of humility our God of honor. Our God of perfection. The spotless lamb of God. Oh, but you're also the lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah. See the fire in his eyes. Beckoning for surrender. Oh, he held his hand out. <laughs> he has his hand held out. Saying, Come, come with me, my beloved. Come with me, my beautiful bride. Oh, for I have something. I have something you've never tasted. I have goodness above, abounding above all imagination. I have the goodness you're looking for.
Ooh, can you sense his presence? See, when you start worshiping, you start praising him, you start lifting up his name, he desires to manifest himself to you. He has no greater desire in the world than for you to fall head over heels in love with him. He doesn't want to be your distant God. He wants to be your lover. He wants to be your bridegroom. Just let's kind of take your time with them. And dance with them. Ha 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 ha. Church, he's real. His love is real. His jealous passion is real. Let's ask if I can come. If I can come in agreement with your faith this, this evening, listen, church. You guys know the, y'all know the, y'all know how we roll. <laughs> if you need us to come into agreement with your faith, if you need healing in your body. opportunity to, to come receive from him.
Who? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, church. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be honored. Hmm? If you can't honor him any day, the, uh, any, any time of the year, this is the time to be honoring him. Hallelujah. 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 Woo. Hallelujah. Everyone all right? Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Leave it to our Latinos. They'll talk to you. Amen. Irish people like to be quiet. Amen. All prim and proper. Yeah. You know. Now in their part of the world, they like to give you an amen every now and then. Amen. You've missed your cue. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, can you believe it, church? Can you believe we're at Christmas? Amen. I'm telling you, it is so surreal. I mean, it seems like it's just, we just moved up here about a, a year ago, and it seems about like two months ago. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I can't, it, it blows me away how, how time flies. Amen. How time flies. But I tell you, anyone enjoy this time of year? I mean, I, I do. It's probably my favorite time of year. I love the festivities. I, I love the lights. Amen. Seeing all the cities and towns all dressed up. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's glorious. Amen. Absolutely beautiful. And if not that, listen, people actually begin to release the attributes of Jesus and begin to give to one another with joy. <laughs> Amen. Not, not expecting something in return. do you? Absolutely amazing. Amen. Absolutely amazing. Now, we all know there's a lot of commercialism with this time of year, is there not? Amen. A lot of commercialism with Christmas. Say, what is that about? It's about the, the world trying to hijack the day that Christians celebrate. Amen. To where it's now the, the world's holiday instead of the, the Christian's holiday. I'm telling you, this is it's an important day. I'm telling you, it's, it's an important day that, that we that we come to celebrate. It's an important day that we that we come together. Amen. Can I just say this without offending anyone, without trying to spoil any traditions or anything like that? But listen, church, I'm gonna tell you, you know, Christmas is not about receiving the gifts you've been wanting. I mean, that's not what Christmas is about. It's not it's not about jolly old Saint Nick. That's not that's not what Christmas is about. I mean, it's what the, the world tries to push it in. I'm going to tell you, that, man, these, these things grieve Holy Spirit. It, it grieves my heart. I mean, why? Because it, it retracts. It, it takes away, amen, from the glory and the honor of our King. Hmm? And how many of you know everything Holy Spirit does, he does to honor him? How many of you know everything we do, we ought to be doing to honor him? Amen, honoring the King. Hallelujah. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, celebrating Claire's birthday, but we're going to sing happy birthday to Barry. Absolutely insane. And we're going to give Barry gifts and hallelujah, we're going to go party with him and leave her at home. <laughs> I mean, we'd never dare do those things in the natural, would we? And we, but we seem to do that when it comes to, to the spiritual things. How, how easy it is for us to, to just wash aside the, the spiritual things in our life. I'm telling you, church, we got to come to that realization that the spiritual is so much more real than the natural. Amen. We come to that recognition or that realization, it'll change everything in our life, change everything we do. Amen. No, this is this is a this is Christmas. Amen. Be the celebration of the birth. Amen. Celebration of the of the incarnation of the King. Amen. Our Lord, our Savior. Amen. Now, if I was going to have a, a Christmas message, Amen, it'd probably be what I'm going to minister today. Amen. You know, probably one of the most basic messages, you know, we, we can hear. Amen. But I'm telling you, it's so, it's so basic in its simplicity. It, it's rich. Amen. It's something I, I love to, to meditate on over and over and over. You say, what is that? Listen, it's this, it's this word incarnation. I mean, this word's been stirring in my heart. I believe, I would hope and pray it's been stirring on your hearts as well. Why? Because this is what we're, what we're celebrating. This is what this time of year is all about. It's, it's about the Christ. About, it's about the Christ and everything that he's done for us. Listen, church, it's significant. Amen. It's a, a significant day that we need to grab a hold of. But do we truly understand the significance of it? Hmm? Or is it just a, a word that, that we use in religious 
days and in religious terms? Is it just church words? Is it just Christianese that, that we use? The incarnation. What, 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 actually is, what actually is it? What, 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 are we, what are we talking about? Because I'm going to tell you, church, I dare you. I dare you, if you'll hear the, the simplicity of this by the Spirit today, I'm telling you, it will change absolutely everything about you. Amen. It'll change the way you read the Bible. It'll change the way you, you dig into the Old Testament. It'll, it'll, it'll change the way you talk to your friends and family. It'll, 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 it'll change everything about you. I mean, if we can just receive, receive the incarnation, receive the revelation of the incarnation. So, so what is the incarnation, church? What is it? Hmm? It's not to be confused with reincarnation, right? They sound very similar, right? They sound very similar, but they're two completely, they're two completely different things, right? Reincarnation to be celebrated by a lot of Eastern religions and, and different things, and many false religions. What, what, is re, what is reincarnation? Well, it'd be described or it'd be defined as the spirit being rebirthed or re-embodied in a different, in a different body, being re-embodied, meaning what? You know, a person goes, you know, lives this life and goes to the next. You know, the, the queen died, you know, maybe she's going to be born as a, as, a, as a servant, you know, in her, in her next life. Life. That's reincarnation. Or if you want to really get down to it, you know, depending on how good or bad you are, amen. If you're if you're a little real rascal in this life, you may get, you know, you may be embodied into a dog that has abusive owners. Amen. I'm telling you, it's absolutely absurd. It's absurd when we think about these things. I mean, good night. We, you know, how, how can it, what the, the links that humanity goes to, to be able to dis, disassociate everything that we look in the skies and see. Amen, to, to where we try to make up rubbish, <laughs> amen, to, to make our flesh feel good about, you know, what we're doing here on this earth. I'm telling you, church, you know, the, the heavens don't lie. Hmm? God, God puts signs in this world. He puts signs for us to, to, to come to this realization of who he is, amen. So, so, so what is it? So what is, the, so what is it? It's not, the, it's not the incarnation, amen. It is the it, or the, the reincarnation it is the incarnation. What is the reincarnation? It's, it, it is a takeoff. You know, how, how many of y'all know that everything the adversary does is a counterfeit? He, doesn't, he, doesn't, he can't come up with anything new. Amen. So what does he do? He just, he just pulls something off of what, of what the Lord has put in place. So he, he can't, you know, the Lord comes up with, with incarnation. So what does he do? He says, oh, we're going to come up with reincarnation. We're going to add something, something to it. We're going to, you know, take the purity out of it hmm? and see if we can get a whole bunch of people running headfirst into hell. Amen. But, but the truth is, there's only one. It's called the incarnation. Amen. And what is it? It only happened one time. It's the only time it's ever going to happen. It's one time. What, what is the incarnation? It's described as deity. It's described as God. It's described as, more specifically, the Son of God embodying flesh. The Son of God putting flesh upon himself. I mean, coming down as a human to this earth. How many of y'all know that, that Jesus, he's still a human? Hmm? He's still human. I mean, see, I think we, I think we just kind of run past some of these things, and we don't really, we don't really catch what what's a, ha, what what happened. You know, we're like, oh, well, Jesus was a human at one time, but then he died. Now, now he's just God sitting up. And no, 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 no. Jesus, when he put on flesh, listen, church, he can completely submit. He's a human forever. Amen. Yeah, yeah. He looks a little bit different. He may be able to walk through walls and be translated from heaven to, to heaven to earth. But listen, church, we're going to have that same type of glorified body as a human as well. Why? He's our example. He showed us what the, what we're going to have. The things do come. Amen. But he's been a human. He's always been a, or he hasn't always been a human. He will always be a human. Amen. After he, after the incarnation, after he took this upon himself. Amen. He wasn't just a human for a season. No, he robed himself in flesh for eternity, for eternity. I mean, this is how, this is how the disciples, you know, when he, when Jesus, after, you know, the 40 days after the resurrection, he came down to this earth and he started, he started talking to the disciples, started, started meeting with the apostles and different people. And he said, look, look, feel me, handle me, touch me. Does a spirit have flesh and bone? Hmm? He's, because he's still human. Yo, Thomas, I know you're down. Listen, just, just stick your finger in my hand. You see, you see that hole in my hand? Just stick your, stick your finger. You see, see the hole in my side? Stick your hand in it. Why? Because he had flesh, he had bone. He didn't become human for a season. This is who he is. 
He is the incarnation of God. You know, I mean, listen, church. You know, he, he, ate with the, he ate with the disciples. He, he, had, he had the crack with the disciples. Listen, I have a lot of foodies. They've, they've asked me this over the years. They say, you know, you think we're going to eat when, you know, when, we get, you know, when we get our glorified bodies, when we're up in heaven? Are we going to eat? You know, it's like, you know, well, yes. You know, Jesus was our example in all things. If he ate with his glorified body, so are we. Why? Because he's still human. I mean, he's showing us what we're going to have. Listen, we've gotten invited to the greatest dinner you're ever going to be invited to. What is that? It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Listen, church, and you're going to eat. You're going to get to dine with the king. Woo! The human king, our king. Hallelujah. Well, there's two things. Listen, church, there's two things we're going to have to understand regarding the incarnation. Two, two things we're going to have to understand as Christians, as disciples, as, as followers of Jesus. There are two things we have to understand. If, and if, we will, if we'll just grab a hold of these things, listen, church, it'll unveil the word of God to you. Yeah, you'll, you'll stop getting confused when you're studying in the Old Testament. Amen. So let, listen, first let's go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Some basic, some basic scriptures here. Stuff we, we, we touch on and we speak on often. Why? Because we want you to have a foundation. How many of y'all know that, that, that there is nothing new in the Bible? Amen. If we're not receiving, amen, if we're not receiving the word of God, if we're not receiving, you know, from the Lord, it's not because we need something new. No, it's because we probably need a heart change. Amen. Why? Because there's nothing new. We just got to allow the Holy Spirit to begin to unveil things to us. Right? So, so in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. We could probably all quote that. In the beginning, amen, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is absolutely amazing when you start breaking these things down, because it's talking about in the beginning. When was the beginning? It was before time was ever created to, for, for the measurement of man. How many of you know God's not measured by time? He's not. Man is. Man, but man wasn't always measured by time. I mean, no, that, that happened that happened when during the fall, right? See, see Adam and Eve, how many of y'all know that, that we were not designed to die? Humans were not designed to die. So what? So time didn't mean anything. Why? Because eternity can't be measured. Amen. When did time come? When the fall came, when sin came, and they yielded unto Satan. This is when these things were created. See, if you look at the Lord in the Word, you know, Peter starts talking about these things by the Holy Spirit, and he says, well, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. This is what it looks like in the spiritual realm with Christ. This is how you can get down, you can get in a prayer meeting, you can get, you can get in conferences or different places. Listen, in time, hours can just go by. Why? Because when you get in the Spirit, listen, church, there is no time. Hmm? There is no time. In the beginning, before anything was created, in the beginning, you know, just like Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens. In the beginning, God created the earth, and the earth was without void. I mean, it was in the beginning. In the beginning, it says God. Who is that? That's, that's Elohim. I mean, that, that's the plural form of God. Who is he talking about? In, in the beginning, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In the, why? Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word, he, it was God. So who was the Word? What is the Word? I mean, is it just, is it just this book? See, we got, see, we got to, we got to come to the, the place of understanding that, that the word of God is not a, this book. The word of God is Jesus. Amen. See, see, the word of God is not these pages. It's not this, this leather covering. It's not the ink that's on these pages. The word of God is Jesus himself. Now, Jesus is the word. He is the spoken word. It is the, it is the word, is the revelation that comes out of these, out of, out of the book, but it's not the pages. It's not, it's not the physical matter here. It's what's been recorded. It's Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This word here is the Greek word logos. It's not rhema. It's not the spoken word of God. It's the log, logos word of God. What is that? We, we like to kind of make that simplify it, and we say that's the written word of God. Amen? But it's not, it's not just the written word of God. I kind of like how Dr. Simmons says it. Yeah, he says it's the, the living expression of God. In the beginning was the, the living expression 
In the beginning was the blueprint. In the beginning was, was the message of God. In the beginning was these things. In the, in, in, in the beginning, this is where, where Jesus existed. I mean, Jesus is the perfect blueprint. He is the perfect living expression. He is the perfect expression of who the Father is. How many, how many of y'all know, you know, one of the key things Jesus came down here to do? Yes, he came here to purchase you and redeem you. Absolutely. But listen, he also came down here to give us a correct revelation of who the Father is. I mean, he said, listen, all you guys have a twisted view on who, on who my daddy is and what he wants to do. So I'm going to come down here as the living expression, the spoken word of God, the message of God to where you can see exactly who he is because I am perfect theology. I'm the perfect study of the Father. I'm the perfect study of God. His name's Jesus. He, he is the word. Amen. How, you, know, you say, why, why does it say the word? Listen, how, how do we express ourselves? How do you express yourselves? We speak. How does the Father express himself? He spoke. Amen. And that spoken word, amen, is, is the expression of, of who he is. And who is that? His name's Jesus, church. His name's Jesus. It says, in the beginning was the word. It's always been the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. There was no separation from him. The, the same was in the beginning with God. I, I, you know, that's such a, that's such a, a simple verse there, but it's probably one of my favorites, you know, uh, coming into these verses here. You say, why? Because of one word that's used there, that word with. I mean, so we, we think of with like it's not a big word, but it's, a, it's actually a powerful word. In the Greek, it's the Greek word pros. I mean, it doesn't mean like, like in the beginning was, God, uh, was the word and the word was with God, you know, uh, and uh, the same was in the beginning with God. It's not, it's not saying that, that Jesus or the word was in the same vicinity. He was in the same neighborhood. He was in the same universe. He was in the same heaven. That's not, that's not what that's trying to say. And see, we try to disassociate things, and, but there's a unity in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is what we talk about when Perry Carey says it's the mutual indwelling between them all. And when he said that it is pros with God, the word was with God, it means that the word is, it lit, the literal translation would be face to face or mouth to mouth. So where was Jesus? He was face to face with God, mouth to mouth. You could feel the, the Father's breath on him. He was that close. Listen, when we talk about presence in this place, this, this, is, what, this is what we're talking about, coming face to face with God. Oh, well, I can't see him now. It's not about seeing. It's about coming into his presence face to face with the living God. This is what we got to be shooting for. This is what we got to be hungering for. And when you hunger, you shall be filled. Amen. You knock, you go, you go answer. Amen. We, we got to be, be pursuing. We got to be coming after these things. Hallelujah. In verse 3, it says, All things were made by him, which is absolutely powerful. And without him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by him and nothing was made that wasn't made by him. And another scripture says that, that all things were made by him and for him. All things were made by him and for him. You say, what does that look like? See, the, see the God initiates, the Father initiates. Amen. What, what does the Son do? The Son administrates. Amen. He starts speaking. What happens? The Holy Ghost begins to demonstrate. Amen. This is how the three work with one another. You know, the Father initiates, you know, Jesus begins to administrate it, and the Holy Ghost, he goes and performs it. He, he manifests it. He demonstrates it. Everything. When, when, the, when, the father, when the Father said, you know, let there be light, what happened? The Holy Ghost went out and he made light. And it never stopped. It never stopped. He initiated it. Jesus spoke it. Hmm? Holy Ghost administrated it. Hallelujah. Why? Because this is the Trinity Church. This is what the Trinity looks like. You know, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Jesus. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of the Father. So you could say that the Holy, the Holy Spirit is the Father. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. Amen. Separate, yes, but they're one. I mean, this is the mystery of the Trinity that you could go around circles and circles and circles. I mean, that's why I love uh, Patrick, you know, St. Patrick, when he came over to Ireland, how he, how he began to, to describe the Trinity with the, with the three-leaf clover. He'd pick up this clover and he said, hey, this, 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 is, this is the Trinity. It's, it's one. It's one, but there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. It's one, but there's three. There's one, but there's three. There's one, but there's one God, but there's the Father, and there's the Son. And there's, a whole, and there's the Holy Spirit, absolutely beautiful and mysterious. It's something you'll probably never come to complete grips with, amen? But, but the reality of it is we take hold of it by faith, amen? 
It's absolutely powerful. I, I, love the, I love those scriptures. I love stuff talking about the Trinity. It says, and in him was life. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. That's that foe. That's the, 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 the manifestation of the life of God, right? In him was the life of men. But it says in him. Who's this talking about? In Jesus. Amen. In Jesus, right? In the word of God. In Jesus was what? Was the life of man. What, what is that life? That's that Greek word zoe. We know what that word means. It's the self-existent life of God. In Jesus was what? The self-existent life of God. It was in him. This is where all life comes from. This is where it's all, it's all derived from. It comes from Jesus. Listen, church, if you can just grab a hold of these verses. I know you've probably heard, heard them a hundred times. Listen, but if you can just grab a hold of these verses, listen, you're going to find out something. Listen, church, Jesus, he's kind of a big deal. He's kind of a big deal. I mean, he's one you want to you want to get to know. He's one you want to know. Fi- you want to find out more information about. He's one you want to get close to. Because I'm telling you, church, he's a big deal. Everything revolves around him. Everything revolves around his city, where he's going to set up his throne. Everything revolves around the king. He is a big deal. He is not just a man, amen, that came down here and failed as as many religions are sitting there teaching. He did not fail. No, he absolutely conquered everything he designed to do. He came down here and he absolutely won. This is this is the Christ. This is the king. He didn't fail in anything. No, he is a conqueror, and he's made you more than a conqueror. He's made you more than a conqueror. You know, Hebrews 2, 2, 14 says, for as much, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, meaning as much as you and I, we are, we're sharers, we have flesh and blood. He says, and check this out, it says, uh, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, yeah, through death, let me, let me back up there. He says that he also himself likewise took part of the same, just as we have flesh and blood, he has flesh and blood. Amen. He, th- this is the incarnation. He took upon flesh and blood, right? And it says, and through his death, he might destroy him that had what? Power over death. And what was the incarnation for? Hey, listen, he came down here to do what? To destroy the one that had power over death. And he doesn't say, you don't, you don't have to wonder who this is. It tells you exactly what it's the devil. It's Satan. It's Lucifer. What did he do? He came down and conquered him. Why did he put flesh on? Why did he put blood and, and, and pumping through his veins and through his body? Why do you do these things? So he could come conquer the one that had us in bondage. He come to feed him. The one that had power over death. How many of y'all death has no power over you anymore? See, this is why, this is why, you know, the psalmist David, when he was, you know, talking in, in, in Psalms 91, that he says that, that with long life you will be satisfied. He was looking by the Spirit into the future. Listen, when Jesus, you know, conquered death, listen, the Lord says that we'll have long life as long as we're satisfied. What does that mean? That means, that means death, it doesn't have a hold of you. That means sickness and disease, it doesn't have a hold on you. And in addictions, it doesn't have a hold on you. No, the word needs to get a hold of you. Amen. Allow the word to get a hold of us, and it'll start revealing some things in our life. Mm, come on, church. That he might destroy. He might destroy the power over death. Hmm? He might destroy the power over death. That is the devil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. I mean, you know that, that death came in this world we, we, you know, when, when we sinned, when, we, you know, when, when our, our mother, our, the humanity's mother and father, Adam and Eve, when they, when they sinned and they received, they, we, we, death had to come upon man. You say, why is that? Because we didn't want to live in, in a sin-filled body for the rest of our life. I mean, death may come to this body if we don't get raptured, you know, I mean, before you die. Amen, but I'm going to tell you one thing. Listen, death has no power over you. You never have to get separated from God. You never have to get separated from his presence again. It's as simple as that. It's as good as that. Hmm? Because he conquered it. What Adam and Eve yielded to, he conquered. For each and every one of us, why so he could win us back. Hallelujah. Now, the second thing we got we to grab a hold of, which is very, very important here. Go with me to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, in verse 15, is a, is a big key that unlocks, that unlocks everything for us to understand and comprehend and have knowledge of the, of the revelation of the word of God that it's all Christocentric. 
I mean that everything in the word of God is, is Christocentric. Everything is revolved, everything is centered around Christ. See, this is see if we can if we can catch a hold of what the what the scriptures, what the, the, the prophetic declaration that is being revealed here. Listen, when you when you start reading the Old Testament, listen, you're not gonna be just looking at it like it's in a history book. I mean, you're gonna start asking Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, reveal to me Jesus. Where's Jesus in this? Where's Jesus in these scriptures? Where's, where's Jesus in Abraham when he went to sacrifice his son on the hill? It, where's Jesus? Was he, was he, was he the, the, the ram caught in the thicket? Where's Jesus in this? Where, where is Jesus when, when God poured judgment on the world and, and flooded it? Where, where was Jesus in that? Was he in the ark? You know, where, where, where is Jesus in these things? I'm telling you, if you, if you begin to search, everything is a prophetic declaration of him. Yes, yes, it tells of our history. Yes, it tells of things from the beginning. But yes, it all reveals Jesus. Why? Because it's all about him. It's always been about him. But we've got to get to that place where we, can, where we can understand what the Lord's trying to reveal to us here. So, so let's, bump on, let's bump on up a little bit here. Let's not go to there to 15 yet. Let's, let's, let's start here in verse. Let's start here in verse eleven. Now we know these scriptures. This is when Adam and Eve, when they when they did sin in the garden, when they when they revealed, when they yielded, excuse me, to to the to the the manipulation of, of Satan, and they they yielded to his word. They sold out to him. Amen. They uh, they started causing a lot of problems for all of mankind. But but it starts here in verse in verse eleven. This is where they. When iniquity fell upon them, yeah, I'll go there, Lord. Where the, where the iniquity fell, uh, when iniquity was, was found in them from yielding into Satan, what happened? The glory of God came off of them. So how many of you know they were, they were covered, they were, they were clothed in the glory of God? Hmm? And then when they sinned, when iniquity, when, when Satan's nature got placed on the inside of them, the glory of God left, and they looked down, they noticed they were naked. I mean, because they weren't covered in his glory anymore. See, it's like it's like you had it's like you had the, the saved people and they 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 walked away from the things of God. Amen. What did Jesus do? Jesus came back down to, to redeem us so we could get so we could get reborn again. We could come back and be the people that, that were that he was designed to be, completely full of his glory. Completely enshrouded in his glory. That doesn't mean you don't wear clothes when you come to church. Amen. But it does mean we can get so, you know, so <laughs> oh man, so caught up in his glory. Amen. That we can be, we can be encompassed. We can be surrounded in it. And here in verse 11, it says, and when he said, who told you, who told you you were naked? I mean, they, why? Because God went out looking for them. And they say, they, they, they hid in the bushes. And they said, we're afraid because we're naked. He said, who told you we're naked? He said, have you, have you eaten of that tree? The, what tree is that? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you eaten of that, of that tree where I commanded you that you should not eat? I mean, I find that absolutely amazing. You know, it's like I gave you one command not to do. Amen. And it's just like humanity today. Amen. You go out and do it. Get, get, allow ourselves to get manipulated. Allow ourselves to get manip manipulated by the words that are going on around us. Amen. It is one command. And they, and they stepped out and did it. One command. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of this tree where I commanded you not to eat of? And the man said, hmm, it was the woman who you gave to me. It was that woman who you gave to be with me. She, see, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. She, you know, she gave me a piece of the fruit of the tree and I did eat it. Listen, church, this, this is where the blame game begins. You know, see, a lot of us think it just happened in our parents' generation or it happened in our generation or it just happened in our children's generation. No, no, the blame game went all the way back to the beginning. I mean, all the way back to the beginning when man sold out to Satan, pulled upon his iniquity, got his sin nature on the inside side of them. And then what happens? You begin to see the, the, the proclamation of the gospel in, in a couple verses and to come. Hmm? Amen. But they, they yielded to the wisdom of Satan. <laughs> I find that absolutely amazing. Yeah, I've been talking with a, with a, with a fellow here recently and, and, I, and he's so convinced of all the power that darkness has. And I'm telling you that, that, that knowledge is the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. But true wisdom, amen, is not what Satan offers. It doesn't come from that tree. I mean, I know what true wisdom is. True wisdom is a person. 
See, you know, people are seeking. Uh, oh, I just need, I just need wisdom. I need more, I need more knowledge. I just need to hear another sermon. I just need to go to this place. I need, I need wisdom. I need a better preacher. I need a better power. I need, I need this. I need, no, wisdom's a person. Wisdom is a person. His name is Holy Spirit. I mean, his name is Holy Spirit. This is what this is what the this is what the word reveals to us. Is what, is what the word reveals to us in Proverbs. Wisdom has always been what personified as a gentle lady. Why? Because this is Holy Spirit. We've talked about this, how, how the Holy Spirit, he's gentle. Amen. He's gentle. He's, he, he gets his feelings hurt. He gets grieved by many things that people do. Amen. He gets grieved by the Why? Because he's gentle. He, but he is wisdom. If you want to seek after wisdom, listen, you got you to go after him. You got to go after God. So if we don't have the, the wisdom of God, if we don't have the wisdom of God, what kind of wisdom do we have? <laughs> we have opinions. We have intellectualism. Intellectualism. And what is, what is intellectualism? Intellectualism, now is, intellectualism is simply knowledge without the spirit of God, without the spirit of God, without the wisdom of God. And it's with, if it's without the wisdom of God, what is it? It's just, it's just from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Hmm? The main thing God said, I don't want you to partake of. Why? Because it's not my knowledge. It's not, it's not, it's not mine. I got, I got something for you. His name's Holy Spirit. Amen. He gives you all the wisdom you need. Hmm? Oh, come on, church. I mean, we, we need to get to know the person of wisdom. I mean, his name's Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what happened here? So, so Adam, what, what did he do? He, he looked over here and, and he says, it was the woman that you gave to me. Amen. See, this is the blame game. It's, it's absolutely hilarious. I mean, you can see it. You can see it in the little kids. You see it in adults. I mean, you see it in, in leadership. You see it in all. It's, it's the blame game. Well, it's, it's simply Adam not, not operating in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit anymore. He starts operating in what? In the, in the knowledge from that tree of good and evil. I mean, he's operating in that knowledge. And what happens? He looks like an absolute fool. He, be, he begins to blame God for his own mistake. I'm telling you, that's, that's an epitome of ignorance. It's the epitome of, of stupidity. I mean, no, I did this, but you know, God, it wasn't really my fault. It was yours. I mean, if you wouldn't have given me that woman, I never asked for her. You're the one who put me to sleep and took that rib out. You gave him to me. It's your fault that this happened, not mine. Come on. Hmm. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what happened? So the Lord looked over at the woman. He said, well, what have you done? And the woman said, it was the serpent. What were you doing? It was the serpent that beguiled me. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I'm absolutely convinced. I think the father, he went to Adam. Why? Because Adam was the head, right? He was the head. He was the leader of the, of, of the marriage there. And then and Adam, when he, when he, when he, when he, when he put, didn't put on his man pants, amen, what, what, what happened? And he went to the wife. Amen. He said, now, wife, why did you do this? And she said, it wasn't me either. You know, it wasn't me. It was, that, it was that snake over there. It was that devil over there. You know, what was God doing? I believe God was just trying to find just, just someone coming to repent. Someone just come to the place of repentance. Someone just say that you were wrong and let me fix this situation for you so it didn't make thousands and thousands and thousands of years of mistakes. Just repent for what you did. No, 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 that's not good enough. It wasn't my fault. I ain't not going to repent for anything. It was your fault. It was your fault. Not mine. Come on. So what did he do? He turned to the snake. He turned to the snake. And the Lord said unto the serpent, because you have done this, you are crushed above all cattle. And above every beast in the field, upon thy belly shall you go, and dust you shall eat all the days of thy life. He goes, now I will put enmity, I'll put opposition, I'll, I'll put a war type mentality between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And it will bruise thy head and you shall bruise Thy heel, you'll bruise his heel. Now, this is the verse we wanted to get to. This is a powerful verse. This, is, this verse is the crucial linking of Christocentric theology. Amen, that everything is centered around Jesus. This is it. This is the prophetic announcement that we, that we got to understand here. The early church fathers called this verse, this verse alone, they called it the, the Proto-Evangelium. Proto-evangelium, it comes from two Greek words. Proto, which means first. 
evangelium. We, we know it sounds like evangel evangelical. It sounds like yeah, evangelist. It sounds like the evangel. What is it? It's the gospel. It's the good news. So what was it? Our early church fathers called this verse the first gospel, the first good news, the first revelation of the good news. And who was actually speaking this? Hmm? It was the father. It was the father. The father, when he saw everything was going up, seeing that, that man was, was full of iniquity, full of, full of, full of the dirt, full of, full of the adversary, what did he do? He, he, he made a prophetic announcement of the first gospel. He started preaching Jesus. Hmm? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, he started preaching the king. He started preaching the king. I'm telling you, I find that absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to tell you, the more you get intimate, the more you get intimate with the Lord, you're going to find out the Father, he loves to talk about Jesus. You're going to find out the Holy Spirit, he loves to talk about Jesus. He loves, Jesus loves to exalt the Father. The Holy Spirit loves to exalt Jesus. Listen, church, this is, this is what we should be about in everything we do. We ought to be exalting Jesus in everything we do. Hmm? Coming to the place of being just like our king, the one that we are made in the likeness and image of. So anyhow, he says here in verse 15, he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and this woman, between thy seed and her seed, between thy seed and between her seed. Now listen, when it says her seed, this is not, this is not a plural word here. It's not saying between her seed, like all of mankind. I'm going to put division you know, between, between you and her and, and between your seed and her seed. It's not saying between you and, and all of mankind. That's not what he's saying. Anyway, this is a singular word. He's saying, he's saying between her seed, one seed. Who is that seed? It's the last Adam. Amen. It's the second Adam. It's the last Adam. I mean, this is why in Isaiah 7, 14, I mean, 700 years before the Christ was born, there was a prophetic word that went forth out of Isaiah's mouth. You know, it, it blows me away. You know, sometimes, you know, I, you know, I've wondered about these. I pondered these things on my own on my, with, with myself. And it's like, Lord, why, why did it take so long for you to bring the Christ? Why did it take so long for, for the king to come down here? And he's like, man, you know how long it took for me to have someone to speak prophetic words so I could bring something to pass? I mean, look at this word that, that, I, that Isaiah, said here in 714 he says therefore the lord shall come the lord himself shall give you a sign he says behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call him emmanuel god with us how long would it have taken for a prophet because see prophets would have got stoned back in these days if what they spoke didn't come to pass right so what so what happened you know he, god talks to someone god talks to another person hey you know you know, you, you, you you start make a declaration that there's going to be a virgin that's going to bear a son i'm not saying that. No, I'm not saying that, Lord. No, I think I'm here. I think I'm hearing something. Hey, get behind me, Satan. I'm, I don't know what I'm hearing. But listen, it took, it took, I'm telling you, it took time for, for God to be able to speak through man. Why? Because people don't want to listen to him. I mean, they killed the prophets left and right. Why? Because man's always against the things of God. Always. Hmm? And I tell you, he got, he got, he got through. In Isaiah, he, he spoke boldly, 700 years. And what happened? 700 years, God started bringing these things into pass. He says, I'm going to give you a sign. What is that sign? It's the seed. It's that seed. It's a son. Amen. It's a son. You're going to, you know, a virgin's going to conceive and she's going to bear a son. And that son is going to be called a man. It's going to be called God with us. That the seed is going to be the physical presence of God here on this earth. The God himself, Emmanuel, God with us in the physical sense through a baby. And he said, and this seed, this Emmanuel, this God in the form of flesh and the seed, I mean, this seed, amen, shall bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. Powerful, powerful. It says thy, you shall bruise thy head and he shall bru and, or he shall bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. Her seed, Jesus himself, he had a bruised foot. Amen. And his bruised foot was going to do what it was going to crush. 
who's going to crush the head of the, of the serpent, who's going to crush the head, the seed of the serpent. I'm telling you, when Jesus, when Jesus stepped up upon that cross willingly, why? Because no one could force him upon it. He willingly jumped up there for each and every one of us. It was the joy that was set before him. And when he got up there, listen, you know what happened to his feet? There were nails that went through that feet to nail him up on the cross. I'm telling you, that, that nails that held him up on the cross, when he got stuck up in the air, he became, just like in the days of Moses, he became that, that serpent that was on top of the bronze staff. And I'm telling you, that serpent crushed the head of the adversary. I mean, his bruised foot crushed his head. The bruised foot crushed the head of the adversary. You say, what does that even mean? His, his bruised foot crushed the head, the authority of adversary forever, forever. I mean, his authority, the, the, the authority of Satan has been crushed forever. This is what we've been talking about for months here about the name. I mean, it's been crushed. His authority has been crushed forever. The power of darkness has no power over you. This is why he said in, in Colossians 1.13 that, that he had delivered us. He has rescued us. He's taken us out of the authority and the power of darkness. And what did he do? He stripped us from that and he translated us and put us in the kingdom of his dear son where we are redeemed by his blood. It's as simple as this, church. But we've got to grab a hold of it. We've got, we got to understand what's going on here. It's, I mean, this is some powerful stuff. It says that, that, he, that the, he shall bruise the head, bruise the authority. Why are we so focused on, on, on dark stuff? I'm telling you, that's, that's the stuff is, is dead. It has no power over us anymore. It's been conquered. Hmm. Hmm. Say, well, where did, where did this all take place? When that cross went up on Golgotha, on Calvary got shoved down in that hole. It crushed the skull. Hmm. How many y'all know? How many y'all know? How many y'all know, y'all know what Golgotha means? I mean, it's the place of the skull, right? The place of the skull. Now, now why is it called the place of the skull? Is it because it looks like it? I mean, you go to Israel, this is what they'll tell you. Oh, it looks like you can see the, uh, as you can see everything, this is, this is the, the place of the skull. That, that, it's, not, it's not because it looks like it. It's because it's the literal place of the skull. Hmm? If everything's Christocentric in the world, in the word, look at David and Goliath. Amen. A type of Jesus and a type of Satan. Hmm? A type of Jesus and a type of Satan. What did David do? He went out and he defeated, he conquered, amen, darkness. He conquered Satan and, and that kingdom. And then what did he do? He prophetically made an announcement. I'm going to cut your stinking head off. I don't even have a sword, but I'm going to cut it off. Hit him with a rock in his head, grabbed Goliath's sword, and chopped his head off. And what did he do? And just like any of the military victors of those days, he took that head everywhere he went. The Bible says he took it back into Jerusalem. He took the head of Goliath back into Jerusalem. Why showing who is the victor? Who is the conqueror? It's Israel. It's Israel. It's Israel. I mean, how many of y'all know that, that, that Goliath's name, I mean, if you, if you, break, if you break it down in, in the Hebrew language, it is Golagatha. Goliath of Gad, Golagatha. Just like Golgotha. Because what did David do? David, just like anyone else, he, he put that head probably right on the spear right there on, on Mount Moriah. Amen. So where everyone could see who the victor was, and then he buried it there and the place of the skull. To when that cross went forth, it began to crush his head. A prophetic declaration of what the Lord is doing. And Jesus' foot may have been bruised, amen, but that bruised foot, I'm telling you, it crushed the head of the serpent. It crushed the head of the enemy forever, forever. But why'd this have to happen? Why'd this have to happen? Why did Jesus have to go through this? Because it was man that sold out. It was man that, that lost the power. It's man that lost his authority. It was man that did these things. It was man that, that sold out, that begot uh, an iniquitous nature upon him that they couldn't fix. It couldn't solve on its own. So what happened? You had to have a man pay the price for it. It had to be paid by what? By, by blood. I don't know why we don't talk about the blood in churches anymore. In terms of the church, the blood is everything. The blood is why we're sitting here today. The blood is why we're healed. The blood is why we're whole. The blood is why we'll, we'll live forever. The blood is why we'll get, to, we'll get to sit at the feet of Jesus in heaven and down here on this earth. It's all about the blood. Amen. But see, our blood was tainted. It, 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 we, couldn't, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't be perfect enough to do it. 
What, what is Leviticus 7, 14 now, the ESV? It says, for the life of every creature is in the blood. It said, its blood is life. The life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. And I'm going to tell you something, church. The blood of bulls and goats, it couldn't suffice. It couldn't purchase you. It couldn't redeem you. It couldn't cast out and defeat darkness. It couldn't defeat Satan. It could not get rid of this iniquitous nature that we receive, you know, from the imputation from Adam. It couldn't happen. It couldn't happen. But there is one. According to Hebrews, Hebrews 4, verse 6, it says, For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, he came into the world. He said, Sacrifice an offering you don't desire. Oh, that, that, that's beautiful. You know, Jesus came down into this world. He, he looked and he said, he, as he's talking to the Father, he said, Listen, sacrifice you don't desire. You weren't desiring a sacrifice. You weren't desiring offering. He says, But a body you prepared for me. A body, a body you prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. But what? He had pleasure in a body. A body was created for him to do what? To be the perfect lamb, to be the perfect lamb to come down and destroy and conquer, amen, this world. Conquer, you know, what Satan's done. Conquer all darkness, the perfect spotless lamb of God. See, this opens up the door to John 1, 14, doesn't it? That, that, the, that, the, that he became flesh, the word became flesh and came and dwelt among us. Ooh, the word became flesh and he came and he dwelt among us. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of churches nowadays, we, we, get a, we get to teaching a lot on the superiority of the humanity of Jesus. Amen. And every, everything that he's done. And listen, there, there, there's, a, there's a lot of truth in that. There's, there's, there's good stuff in that. But listen, church, we can, we can never get these things confused. Amen. The word became flesh. Let me say that again. Jesus, the word, became flesh. The flesh didn't become the word. You say, why, why is that important? Because listen, church, it wasn't just because he was a great prophet. It wasn't just because he had an amazing anointing. It doesn't matter that he, it's because he, it doesn't mean because he got, you know, a mil, you know, million people, you know, uh, healed and set free and delivered. You know, John says that if, if the, every miracle that was associated with him was written in the Bible, listen, there wouldn't be enough room in the world to contain the books of it. Listen, it wasn't because of that. It wasn't because he was so perfect, amen, that, 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 that this is why his name gets written in the greatest book of all time, sold around the world or sold around the world. This, this, it's, it's not because of that. No, it's because in the beginning, I mean, in the beginning, it was the word that took upon flesh. The flesh didn't take on the word. You know, the word didn't become because, because he was a great flesh. If I'm, it seemed like I'm talking into circles. Is this making any sense? It's not because of how good he was, which he was perfect. That didn't make him the word. No, he was the word, and because he's so good, he took on flesh. Amen for each and every one of us. He became the incarnate word. He is the living expression of the Father. He is the blueprint of the Father. Whew. I'm going to tell you something, church. This has always been the plan of God. This has always been the plan of God. God was not blindsided by Satan. He was not blindsided by Satan. He's always a step ahead. And he's always a million miles ahead of him. He's never get caught by surprise. He didn't get caught by surprise with Adam and Eve. He didn't get caught by surprise. It's always been the plan. Why? Because he knows the beginning from the end. He knows, he knows the first from the last. You know, there's a, a minister, and I can't remember his name, is back around uh, right after the healing revival in the U.S. He talks about God. How is, how it's like he looks on a, on a wheel, and he can see the spokes of time. Why? Because he's not, he doesn't exist in time, but he can see the beginning from the end. He wasn't surprised at the things that took place. Hmm? You say, well, what was his plan? If he's already had a plan, what was his plan? His plan was a baby. His plan was a baby, a baby that, that we're celebrating. A baby, that, a baby that created the heavens and the earth and everything that dwells within it. The baby that created all of mankind. The, the, the baby. His name is Jesus. 
His name is Jesus. And see, once you, once you come to, to receive a revelation and a knowledge of what this, this name even means, listen, you're going to find out that the name of Jesus, it's a declaration. It's always been a declaration. It's not a, it's not, it's not, it's not a cuss word that we use when we're upset. It's not, it's not the ending to our prayer. Amen. It's not, it's not just something that we use to, to qualify something. It's not something, whatever it may be in your life. Listen, church, it is a declaration. It's a prophetic word that comes out of our mouth. Jesus, the Christ, Yeshua, the Christ. What does that even mean? What does Yeshua mean? What, what does Jesus mean? Well, Jesus, Jesus and Joshua, that'd be the, the English and the, and the Greek form of, of the Hebrew, meaning Yeshua. What is Yeshua? It means, it means God is our salvation. It means, it means Yahweh saves. Yahweh is my salvation. Yahweh saves. What is the Christ? It's the anointed one, the anointed king. So every time, you know, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Christ comes out of your mouth, you're making a, you're, you're prophesying, you're speaking out power. You're saying, what, what are you, what are you even, what are you even saying? You're saying that, that Jesus, you know, is Yahweh who saves, who is my salvation, who purchased my sickness, who, who freed me from disease, who got me delivered, who, who rescued me from hell, who did everything I need. He is my salvation and he is the king of the world and he owns me. He owns me. He purchased me. Yeah, he's my salvation. Yes, yes, he's my king, but he owns me. Amen. I'm telling you, when you get, you get a revelation of who that is, you'll, you'll stop using those words as, 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 a, as, a common, as a common form coming out of your mouth. No, no, when you look and you say the name of Jesus, you say Jesus the Christ, you expect heaven and earth start to move. You'll start, you'll start expecting sickness and disease to leave. You'll start expecting the dead to be raised up. Why? Because this is a declaration. Was it done by accident? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. See, when we receive the, the fear of the Lord, hmm? you receive that, that fear of the Lord, what happened? Wisdom comes upon you. Huh? <laughs> How do I get wisdom? Proverbs tells us about the fear of the Lord. Well, I know why most of the church doesn't walk in wisdom anymore. They have no fear of the Lord. They don't honor the Lord. They're not reverencing the things of God. And we don't reverence the things of God, man. Wisdom, whoop, right out the door. Why? Because wisdom's Holy Spirit, and he gets grieved. Hmm? So when we receive this wisdom, when we receive Holy Spirit, we yield the Holy Spirit, amen, we receive this wisdom. I'm going to tell you, church, there's, you'll find there's nothing uncommon about this word. There's nothing uncommon about Jesus, and there's nothing uncommon about his name. It's absolute power. It's absolute glory. Hey, man, it's absolute, absolutely amazing. And this is what we're celebrating. We're celebrating this name. We're celebrating our king. We're celebrating the word. Hmm? Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Hmm? Who gave up all for us. Who loved us so much. He said, I can't, I can't bear you guys. I can't bear my family being stolen from me. So I'm going to put flesh upon this body. I'm going to remain a human for, for eternity. And I'm going to go sacrifice my life. And I'm going to purchase you back by the perfect blood of the lamb. I'm telling you, his name's Jesus. Jesus and he defeated darkness forever. Forever. Mm. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your name. I thank you, Lord Yahweh. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Ooh, teach us, Lord. Teach us, reveal us. Reveal to us, Lord. Even messages we've heard a hundred times will reveal something to us. Reveal your goodness. Spark something back in us, Lord. Lord ignite some of these, some of our dead hearts that we have, Lord. Hmm. And we want to be a, a more fire more hungry. Hmm. More consumed by you. How oh, we thank you for it, Lord. Lord, we celebrate you. We, we honor you. We thank you, Lord, for the incarnation. We thank you, Lord, for your boldness, Lord, that you, whew, that you didn't let anything stop you. You didn't let anything get in your way. 
you became flesh and you dwelt among us. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, Lord, reveal your word to us. Open up your word to us. Change us. Hmm. May, may this year, may this Christmas season, may even before we get into the new year, new year, Lord, may we come to this place of having a newfound love with you. May we, may we be not like the church of the, of the Ephesians, Lord. May we be a people that, that hunger and thirst after our love, our first love which is you. So we thank you for it, Lord. Hallelujah. We glorify you for it. We thank you, Lord, for, for Psalms 91. But there shall no evil befall us, neither, neither shall any plague come nigh our dwelling place, Lord, for you, for you give your angels charge of us. You love us, Lord. Lord, we receive that protection. We thank you, Lord, the angels are encamped front, back, and side to side. We thank you, Lord, for the righteous labor of our hands, Lord, as many of us are taken off here in, in, the, in the days to come. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are an absolute blessing un, under these places. Lord, we're, we're an actual miracle because we're there, Lord, because your kingdom comes upon the scene when we're there. We thank you, Lord. May, they be, may it become our ministry, not just a place we put our hands to. But we thank you, Lord, as we put our hands to something, Lord, we thank you, Lord, it prospers. It's going to prosper for the kingdom. It's going to prosper for you. We adore you. We love you. Hmm. We're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for your word. We're also thankful for your humanity. Lord Jesus, we, just, we can't get enough of you. Oh, we thank you for your body. We thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for the ambassadors of Christ you've called each and every one of us to be. We're thanking you, Lord, here at Island Church. We are covered by your blood, Lord. We're empowered by your word, and we're anointed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.